it's a hemorrhagic fever, which puts it in the same category as Ebola. It was gruesome. People's eyes, ears, mouths, anything could bleed because the virus was attacking the blood vessels. Um, and internally, the same thing was happening. So one of the most common symptoms of yellow fever was uh, what they referred to as black vomit. Um, it was actually digested blood from internal hemorrhaging. It, it attacked the brain as well, so there was a lot of um, delirium that went on, on with it, which I think was very disturbing to the people caring for yellow fever victims. And the last um, organ usually to fail was the liver, and when it did, it releases a surge of bile, which turns the yellow, the jaundice, the body and whites of the eyes yellow. Um, in the body's attempt to fight off this virus, uh, it caused these high, high fevers. So um, it was typical to see a fever at 105, 106. Um, some of the Memphis doctors who were performing autopsies during the epidemic said that it felt like the organs had literally were boiling at the time of autopsy. Memphis was no stranger to yellow fever. The grim disease had visited the city at least three times in its history. In mid-June of 1878, word came upriver confirming that yellow fever was in New Orleans. That same month, Dr. Robert Wood Mitchell, one of three doctors on the Memphis Board of Health, called for money to initiate a quarantine. But a quarantine would have done nothing to stop disease-carrying mosquitoes from entering the city. 19th century medicine had no knowledge or tools to cope with such an invasion. They believed that the disease was caused by poisonous miasmas that emanated from the Gayoso Bayou. On August 13th, the Board of Health announced the first yellow fever death in Memphis. But that official case is really what marked um, this mass exodus out of the city. And people described it just as, you know, they would get on anything that would float in the Mississippi. They would get on the trains, um, wagons, anything they could to get out of the city as quickly as possible. Um, some people left doors open and their tables still set with silver, was how one person described it. Uh, so with a population of about 40 uh, to 45,000, they estimated 25,000 people fled, um, about half the population at the time, and this was in a matter of three days. The remaining population of some 19,000 people were witness to a daily roll call of the dead that wouldn't stop until the arrival of the first frost. My darling little daughter, we are in the midst of death and desolation. Today we are alive, but tomorrow may find us dead. Victims of one of the most terrible plagues that ever desolated any country. Nothing seems to stop the progress of this grim destroyer. Frost is our only hope, which seems far in the distance. Julia Rain. Here you have like this picture of heavy plumes of smoke going up in the air. It had to had a strong smell to it. Dead bodies coffins out, uh, waiting to be picked up. Uh, people avoiding contact with other people, armed people, and the cannon firing. It had to be, as, uh, again, a reminiscent of Dante's Inferno. It, it got really just horrific um, in the city itself. They, the undertakers were burying people in mass graves because they couldn't uh, keep up with the amount, the, the bodies that were coming through. They would locate bodies by buzzards, um, anything they could just throughout the city. And a lot of the houses had been marked um, with, they would hang up a, a piece of cardboard, a black piece of cardboard for someone um, who had died and put the dimensions of the coffin needed. So a couple of times a day, the undertaker would come through the city and round up um, the bodies and put them in the coffins and take them to Elmwood and put them in the um, big mass grave that has close to 1,500 unidentified bodies in it now. Medical science of the 19th century had no clue as to the cause of yellow fever and few weapons with which to fight a disease that could kill within a matter of hours. And there were several Memphis physicians, Dr. Robert Wood Mitchell, Dr. Gustavus Thornton. Dr. Thornton said, you gave him a good emetic, that is, you gave him a good cleaning out, and then you gave him fluids and total bed rest and nothing else. I think for the doctors, a lot of it just was managing um, these houses. They would, they would enter a house and find the father and the mother dead in the bed with the children, you know, sick on the floor and would not know how many hours or days that the children had been left unattended. Um, it, was, it was just horrific all around. Um, so a lot of what the doctors did was just feed people, take them water, um, and get the undertakers to remove the bodies. 
By early September, the disease was averaging 200 deaths per day. Coffins were stacked on the streets awaiting burial. Fever fires burned. And in the distance was the sound of cannons being fired across the Gayoso Bayou in an effort to clear the air of poisonous miasmas. It was said you could smell death from three miles outside the city limits. It taxed every resource that was available. Doctors made house calls just night and day, and a number of the volunteer doctors who came here in 1878 died because they themselves uh, contracted yellow fever, and they were exhausted. 111 physicians were under the direction of Dr. Robert Wood Mitchell of the Howard Association. Many of these doctors were volunteers from as far away as New York and 3,000 nurses, many of them African-American, assisted as best they could. One of the Howard physicians was Dr. William J. Armstrong, a survivor of the 1873 epidemic, who wrote letters to his wife and eight children who had fled Memphis at the onset of the disease. From Dr. Armstrong's letters, we can envision a city gripped by fear and despair. August 24th. My dearest one, the outlook grows more gloomy each day and gives no promise of a break short of frost. What a fight it will be, and how ceaseless. No one but the poor worn-out physicians know what it is. Kiss my dear children for me, and I do hope God will spare us all to meet at the old fireside soon. He wrote these very touching letters to his wife throughout the epidemic. Um, he was helping take care of the nuns um, and the, the St. Mary's community there that had set up um, sort of a makeshift hospital, mainly for the orphaned children, a lot of the children that were left behind when their parents died. September 3rd, I do not see how it is possible for me to work through it all. How I did it before, I do not know, but this is worse than all. The numbers of deaths as reported are frightful. Yesterday, 208, but that is simply the accumulation of what Jack Walsh could not bury and not the deaths for that day. Some of the bodies lie three and four days unburied and produce hard smells in the locality. I wish I could go to some secret spot where there would be no burning heads and hands to feel, nor pulses to count. It is fever, fever, all day long. The altruistic spirit of medicine is embodied in the bravery of the doctors, nurses, and volunteers who fought the fever. Of the 111 Howard physicians, 54 were stricken by the disease, and 33 died. September 10th, one by one, the Howards and the doctors are falling. Out of five of us at the drugstore, Dr. Sam and A.B. are in Virginia, Humes is dead, and Channing down with a pretty bad case. September 11th, my dearest one, it is now nearly nine o'clock and I have just gotten in. Channing is very low tonight and I fear the worst will come. Of all the five, I alone am standing. Those words ended Dr. Armstrong's last letter. He took ill with the fever on September 16th and died four days later on the 20th. He was buried in Elmwood Cemetery. On the night of October 18th, the long prayed for killing frost arrived. Of the 19,000 people who had stayed in Memphis, an estimated 17,000 contracted yellow fever and 5,150 died. The numbers of deaths were higher than the Chicago fire, the San Francisco earthquake and the Johnstown flood combined. Um, and to even put that in perspective today, uh, more people died in that epidemic than we lost on 9-11, more people died in that epidemic than Pearl Harbor, and more people died than Hurricane Katrina. In many ways, the old river town that was Memphis died in 1878 and would be replaced by a new city that grew up in the 1880s.